to uh, start the presentation. Okay, I'm unmuting my microphone. I just want to do a sound check because, um, uh, Mr. Senyog, we were getting a lot of back, uh, background noise uh, still, even with your session, with your speaking. How is the how is the sound now? I can hear you very nicely. Is there any echo or anything like this? Yeah, something is there. Yeah, there's there's an echo. There's something, yeah, echo. A double yeah, sound. So I suspect there is some people that still do not have their microphone muted. We're getting a feedback. So I suspect yeah. there is some people that mute the microphone. We're getting I see Brad here. I think people have got their YouTube on and also running the Google Sheet. That's because the, the YouTube is delayed. Feedback. Their YouTube on and also. Ah, okay. Right. Now it's okay, I think. Right. Okay. Now it's good. Okay. Right. I think we're good. Yes, everyone? The sound is, is now clear? Yeah, yeah. Very clear. Feedback? Okay, yeah. excellent. Okay, good, good. All right, so we can begin then. So um, uh, thank you very much. And um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, and both uh, Brad and myself, Brad is our digital learning manager. Uh, in discussion the other week with uh, uh, Dr. Ramhari, uh, we uh, 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 talked about doing something for CPSC to share what is the latest in, in developments, particularly for digital learning for technical and vocational uh, education. So um, we have a nice presentation, and dem live demonstration for you today. And so um, uh, I will start to share my, my, my screen here and we can get underway. Right. So just to check with everybody. Uh, so uh, this, uh, people can see the screen. Already? Yes, sir. Yes, doctor. Okay. Yes. Very yes, good. Very good. This is, I must say, this is my first time to use Google Meet. Uh, I think a, a number of us have been doing uh, webinars and sessions uh, recently. Uh, it seems to be the new way for us all to communicate together. Normally, we would be in some lovely location or some interesting spot or school. Uh, and, and, and doing this uh, together in person at a, at a conference or a meeting. I remember uh, the, the other year, uh, about a year and a half ago, the, the wonderful session that CPSC had in Kathmandu, uh, where I had the pleasure of, 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 of presenting there, and that was a, a marvelous experience. And there, at these events, you can meet the CPSC family uh, and, and people, but you know, it, it is expensive to go to those places, and both in time and, and, and cost. And so <clears throat> doing the physical venues, I, it is, although more personal, it's more limiting to us. And so it's nice to be able to do this digital technology. And I hope that we can do more of it uh, in, the, in the future too as well, uh, because now we have to. I think many of us are watching this from home and uh, we are seeing that, um, uh, you know, try to keep ourselves busy, busy and engaged during this period of this, this COVID crisis. I did a seminar, just a uh, uh, webinar last week with World Didac, as m many of you may know, or some of you may know. I'm also the president of World Didac, which is the Global Association of Educational Manufacturers and Developers. And so we had uh, on that one, the Asian Development Bank uh, and uh, UNESCO and UNIVOC uh, together doing interviews about how is teaching and learning going to change here in, in, in the future? Has this COVID uh, crisis affected us? You know, with the number of students that are out of the uh, out of the education system right now, it's topped over 1.5 billion, according to UNESCO. I think their latest figure is 1.6. Uh, and the disruption that's happened to us all is unprecedented. We nobody was prepared for this. And nobody saw it coming necessarily, although it was talked about what a pandemic might do. Um, now we can see it. And will this be the last one? Well, we're not even through this one yet, uh, but it's very likely that, 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 that something like this could happen again. I mean, just the way with the mobility of humanity and the way that diseases evolve, this could be hopefully not a regular occurring thing, but you know, it's, it's not out of probability in the future. But what this has highlighted here, and I think the theme, one of the themes we had in our, in our webinar last week, is 
if this raises the awareness of the role, particularly of digital learning and online learning, how powerful it can be in times of crisis, but also looking at how powerful it can be uh, even during normal times. Uh, we've talked about this, explored this, even you know a year and a half ago in, in Kathmandu, we were talking about digital learning. Uh, and there's a lot of people excited about it. But up until this time, um, particularly in technical and vocational education, uh, we've not had um, a transformative experience yet. We have not seen any uh, vocational technical system, much less others, uh, in other uh, educational areas, ad adapt and adopt uh, online learning as a central platform of their of their teaching learning system. Um, it, it a lot of discussions happen about it, and many people now <laughs> I've had them calling up, calling us up over the past you know month or two and say, "Remember when we were talking about that two years ago? I wish we had done it then." You know, because then we would have been in a in a situation that would be more prepared uh, for right now, and so this is the type of thing. Now it's it's raising awareness. It's not that people have not been aware of this, but we have not done it. So if we can make this come out of this crisis, that this becomes a tipping point for more schools to embrace digital learning in what sort of form or another, um, then this will make our system better. I mean, I, I really think that digital learning is the key to transforming education. Uh, but all of us need to embrace it together, particularly the educational leaders, the school administrators, directors, and the teachers. You know, thus together we can we can make a difference and we can make this happen. So today uh, we're going to uh, show you LabTech's take on this. We've been uh, pursuing digital learning for TVET for 15 years with traditional e-learning and 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 what you might call even re at first it was replacing textbooks and then we do a little animation we do some videos and then it was put into a, a learning management system and and often these things were tied to uh, our training equipment as you know lab tech is is one of the major companies in the world that that designs and develops technical education equipment we we are perhaps considered in the top five globally for this and our base is in Asia our, our heart is in Asia uh, our, our clientele is around the world, though. And what makes us different is we are a, a hybrid, a fusion company. We are we are part Asian, we're part Western, uh, we're very international. Um, and so our goal and objective is to assist developing countries in, in, in pushing the boundaries of, of teaching and learning for technical education. And we've done this very well. We've been around for 30 years. Over 80 countries in the, around the world use lab tech training systems. Uh, thousands and thousands of schools. Uh, over 30 years, we train millions and millions of students, and we have developed over 1,000 training systems in six major technology areas, um, which is the world's largest collection of technical training uh, systems. So this has provided lab tech a unique platform to move into digital age. We are experts in hands-on. We're experts in creating uh, training systems. We get lots of feedback from, uh, from, from our clients from around the world. And uh, this puts us in a unique position to have the resources uh, to be able to create a new generation of interactive, uh, highly realistic uh, learning software that's based actually on game-based uh, 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 3D platforms. And, um, this is this has the potential to change what we're doing in technical and vocational education, which has always been my dream. You know how we can evolve uh, learning to make it better, to make it faster, to make it scalable, to make it less costly. Uh, all these things, you know, to re to relieve the burden of the teachers, you know, to help them in their in their goal of of training well trained, uh, acceptable. Uh, 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 students that that would be acceptable by education and industries around the world. So in this, uh, I'm going to present some of these slides are new. Some of them are from presentations I've done before, uh, but they're very appropriate. One of the problems that we've had, and and often the particularly the last couple of years, I've spoken a lot about Industry 4.0 and the effects on on technical vocational education. Last August, we did a uh, we I, I hosted a um, 
panel session for the Asian Development Bank at their Skills Development Forum in Manila, uh, which was talking about TVET and 4.0 and, and the interactions there, which there are two sides of that. There is what's happening in technology that we have to teach for, and there's also about people being displaced actually by, by work changing and work is changing very fast now. So this has been our background problem. I mean, we we actually are kind of spinning around in, in the TV area trying to keep up with technology. And and so this is this has been a part of the problem. And now with the crisis added on, it is even enhanced this area. But when people talk about smart things, we talk about smart cities, smart hospitals, smart highways, smart factories, but I have yet to hear a presentation talking about smart education of this you know we're talking about industry and society but not how we teach and learn you know it, it's kind of gotten into the background and somehow education has been exempt from being transformed uh, and education is uh, far behind other industries uh, in in transformation industry has been transformed social communications have been transformed with all these platforms you know that you you, you can hardly count them now, all, all the things that are, that are out there. The latest one, TikTok, you know. But, you know, your Facebooks and your Instagrams and things like this are, are transforming how we communicate, how we share information. This is actually learning also as well. And, and as part of learning is sharing because we're people, we're, social, uh, uh, we're socially oriented. And so this is a natural thing. Uh, but yet we have yet we have yet to transform into into education. But uh, as we work in this area and and Labs Tech um, uh, through our experience and through our dialogue with our our academic partners and vocational technical education partners, we can see how it can transform. In fact, people that visit Lab Tech and look at our production facilities, our creation of digital content, and and what we're doing. Uh, I had a rector of a uh, very famous university quite some time uh, last year come and visit and said at, at lab tech i can see the future of education and what is possible i did not know we could do this well this is what we're going to share with you today what what can we do where does the state what is the state of the art of using digital learning for technical vocational education and what could it possibly do uh, for us so one of the areas is medical um that uh we um uh, is is a is a is a good parallel uh, between this uh, in education. Medical has has certainly transformed uh, and is transforming and has transformed from record keeping to patient care to pre patient care to post patient care. Um, how you get your medications, which uh, and and the whole ecosystem. There is a digital component in all of this, and they and it works. Uh, you can see it in, in various countries to various levels, of course. But uh, uh, it is actually a good model if you look at parallels. Okay, how do you get your med medication? How do you how do you report back to your doctor through your devices? Th this could also be used for learning. How do you get your learning materials? How do you communicate with your teacher rather than your doctor? How are you assessed? Um, how do you know you have a problem? You know uh, here, and what do you do about that? And you know, going into the hospital uh, could be very much like you have to go into the the institution, and there's some things that you have to do there that you can't do elsewhere. Uh, but there is a lot of stuff that you can do elsewhere. And when you think about it in those broad terms, there's a lot of parallels uh, between uh, uh, the healthcare industry and also education. And I think we could examine that. I'd love to see a model uh, like this come out uh, in the future. But what at the core of this, what we're having to do is that we realize that technology is changing very fast. This causes jobs to change very fast. Uh, some are saying that within five to 10 years, 50% of the jobs out there do not exist even today as we speak. So there are jobs out there that we're training people for that we don't even know uh, what they are. And this has been an issue that we've discussed many times before. Uh, how do you deal with that, you know? Uh, and the short answer is strengthen the fundamentals and strengthen learning how to learn. Uh, these are probably two of the most important things that we can teach students today so they can continue learning, which they will have to do throughout their life. One of our guests uh, at the World Didact session was the UNESCO Director for Lifelong Learning. And we had some very interesting conversations about this. 
we have to, in order to teach lifelong learning, you have to practice lifelong learning. That means the institution needs to embrace it, the teachers need to embrace it, and they need to not tell the student to do it, but they need to lead by example. So we all need to learn together uh, in, in, in these ways. Of course, as skills change, that means what we teach and learn has to reflect this whole process here. And at Lab Tech, this is what we try to do. What we think a lot about this, we experiment, we test new models, we, we, do, we get feedback on these, we find out what actually works and, and what, what, what doesn't work also as well. This is a very good chart I'd like to share with people. Uh, it's called the Technology Integration Matrix. This is developed by the Florida Center for Instructional Technology from the University of South Florida. They're the number six research university in, in, in the US. And uh, when people talk about technology like now, you know, what technology are we going to use? We have to get online. It's an emergency. Where are we going to go? So most of the people come up with, I hear most frequently, MOOCs and Zoom or here we have Google Meet. You know, this is a, another substitute for Zoom. Uh, Skype doesn't work so well like this. So, um, but this is what we call, what, what does that fit in? And then we hear some people talking about AI and stuff like this. So this has a five step uh, approach here. We call it entry, adoption, adaption, infusion, transformation. What this classifies, you can classify every single digital learning according to these five different areas. Entry level basically means you're using a technology and it's substituting, you're still doing what you normally do, you haven't changed the way you're doing it, but how you may be delivering it may be slightly different. Today's example is, is, is a good case in point. We're using Google Meet to have a conference and, and, a, and a discussion and a webinar, you know, and that we could do that physically. Normally we do do this physically. Now we're doing it in a slightly different way. This is entry level. This is nothing special. Um, it is just using technology to communicate online digitally. MOOCs are the same, the same area. I have MOOCs down at a lesser entry point because they're less effective. Uh, MOOCs have a very as many of you may have read, a miserable pass rate. Most students don't complete it. It's, it's well over 90% of the entrance on, on particularly the massive ones, massive online learning, um, don't make it, they drop out. So the dropout rate is really, really high. It's not really very effective. Good online programs with good content and learning management system is now an, an adoption level. It depends on how good that content uh, if that content is interactive, then we're now up into ad adaptation. If we're using game-based content like we're talking about today and nonlinear learning, we're now getting into infusion. This is where lab tech works. What we're showing you today is in this area, adapting the technology to your use and infusing it throughout your teaching and learning program in a regular area, it be in a regular way. It becomes a pillar of your, your teaching practice. It becomes a pillar of your learning practice. It becomes a way that students now expect to, to learn. Actually, students want to learn in this way. They're very digitally savvy uh, for the most part, even more than the educational community of us teachers and lecturers and administrators. And, and they're ready for this. They do this themselves. They do this socially and they do this for entertainment and it's not happening for education, which is one of the reasons that quite a few students get switch off to our education systems. We're not delivering learning in the way that they're used to interacting with, with, with people. So here we're talking about this, but there is still future out there. There's transformation. We haven't reached there yet. These are uh, using artificial uh, learning uh, intelligence to determining learning characteristics. And then if you have non-linear learning or multi-pathway learning, uh, which actually is game comes from game-based uh, theory that uh, and platforms, that we can then assess a learner and, and see what he doesn't know and guide him to the areas that he doesn't know. So if you already know something, you need to spend less time on it. If you don't know something, this is where we need to guide the, 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 the student back to. And all of us as teachers, I'm sure we try to do that. You know, when we're teaching, we try to figure out, okay, you know, uh, student one, he doesn't understand this. I will spend more time with him to help him uh, understand it because if he doesn't get the fundamentals, he gets lost later on. And this happens in TVET very much so, we have to admit. We, we, teach to the, we have to teach to the average. We have to teach to the mean 
of the class because we have to keep the class moving. And in so doing so, we lose both the fast learners, they're bored, and they'll drop out and they'll find something else to do. And we lose the slow learners because they don't understand. And un misunderstanding accumulated on top of misunderstanding leads to confusion. And you know they won't pass and they won't get it. They won't be effective at doing their job. And in TVET, as we all know, it's, it's a competency-based situation. Uh, it's not like academic subjects. You know, if you get a 90% pass rate in history, you get an A and rewarded. Your family is happy. Mom and dad are going, yay. Your teacher's going, yay. 90%, that's fantastic. You get an A. But if you put a transmission back together, only 90%, doesn't work. <laughs> it's a fail. It's this. We're holding our TVET students to a higher standard level of competency than we, the academic. But yet, the brighter ones are cho cho are selected to go to the academic. TVET is hard. TVET takes time to do this, and this is the problem with students learning at different rates. You know, it might take somebody. They may need to repeat a task over and over and over again until they, they, they understand and they get it. Some people might need only one or two times. Other people need 20 times. How do we accommodate that? That's very difficult for teachers to do, and, and the burden is, is always challenging. And I find TVET teaching one of the most challenging uh, uh, roles that we have out there in, in education, and therefore I salute all, all TVET teachers. It is a very challenging thing. So what does this new future look like, you know, in this way? We call it virtual TVET or 21st century TVET. And this is where we're, we're, we're having a blending of digital and physical. I think the best way to teach uh, vocational technical skills is blended learning. I was having a conversation with Rajas Panth at the, at the ADB at our, our webinar last week with the World Didact. And, and he was also uh, concurring, said that, you know, the ideal way is blended learning, part digital and part physical. And we'll get to that in a moment. So at Lab Tech, we work actually in seven areas. We do air conditioning and, and, and uh, refrigeration or HVAC, as we call it. We do different types of electronics from communication to instrumentation to uh, data acquisition. We do uh, computer and network technology for um, uh, this is the yeah. engineering side. Okay. Hello. Sorry, I can hear your microphone. Automotive, um, we do automotive, we do green technology, electrical, and biomedical. These are about, might be 50 different trade areas if you have a trade-based curriculum within here. And so at the center, we're doing virtual TVET, uh, or in the U.S. we call it virtual CTE, career and technical education, and we create virtual models of the real things. And we're able to do a lot of the training in the virtual sphere and prepare the student before he goes into working in the, in the workshop. And this is ideal because this cuts your workshop time down by probably 50%. It makes it more focused and also relieves the, the burden from the teacher from a lot of the theory, uh, and it does it in a very good way. So what is virtual TVET? What we try to do, at its heart, we're using technology for teaching and learning for TVET. We're using interactive 3D modeling uh, tools. This is gaming platforms to create animations and simulations to visualize technical processes. This is the key thing. Visualizing technical processes uh, is, is what we're doing because we are we're doing we're teaching the parts uh, that is difficult for the students to understand. It can be delivered on a regular computer, a tablet, a mobile phone. Uh, you can also use virtual reality and augmented reality, but this is later. This is more advanced uh, for for larger institutions. We do get into this, but this is not the heart of the program. We want to put that content into the hands of the student online uh, with his own devices. The content can be delivered through a learning management system that provides student performance uh, uh, for the schools and to educational managers. So you get data about what the students are doing and what and how much they've accomplished real time. So, so administrators and educators can make real time decisions about and look at how effective their program is or not. Learning can be off campus and on campus. The big discussion right now is off campus and online. And schools can be networked together to form functional clusters uh, and, and things like this. So 
this is a very interesting chart. I think that you'll 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 be uh, fascinated with. It's very simple, but it has very very uh, in depth uh, meaning. The more you look at this, the more it explains a lot of things. First of all, what we're looking at is the is the learning process, and we start on the right and we move to the left here. So this would be the beginning, and at the left would be your ending of your point. So we generally move. Courses, for the most part, go from theory and they move more into the practical. Or in the vocational side, we say from cognitive, effective to psychomotor. So we already, we, we in the beginning when we're doing more theory, uh, this could also represent the lines between theory and practical. Many schools have 70-30, 50-50, or 30-70 as far as what they do from practical to, to hands-on, depending upon the level of, of, of uh, vocational and technical training that they're at. But I've set this chart 50-50 because I think that is always for me been a, the best balance. Now, what we're doing up here is we can probably replace the entire theory instruction through e-learning and virtual simula simulations, whether it's 2D or 3D. And so we can create digital learning delivery that will basically replace all the theory, all the lectures that the teacher needs to do. The teacher can use this as supplemental or he can let this, if the content is like what Lab Tech does, it actually is self-study and he can just let the student go. And maybe even flip the classroom. He can even do assignments and let the student do that, that learning afterwards uh, off campus and online. So he prepares and does this, and then he goes into the hands-on at the school. This has to be at the institution. But what this may look like can now change because of what we've done here in the virtual area. We actually are doing some of the applications, the practical work in the virtual area. The more powerful these tools get, the more that we can do here. So wherever we are at here, at this level, even if we're only at 20 or 30% right now, over the years, this will expand and we'll be needing to do less practically. Of course, that means our laboratories will change. The equipment that we need here will be less. And that's a good thing because vocational technical education is very expensive. The labs that we set up in ideal schools, you know, can rust, run into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. So we've set up labs that are billion dollars or more. Nobody, not everybody has the budget. In fact, few do. Few countries have that type of budget to do, do it ideally. So this is a good replacement. This is inexpensive and it gives you the new technologies and the new ways, uh, the new information for the students that may not be in your labs then. So the lab equipment be more of hands-on in the future under, under this, 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 this guidance. We also have in here in the middle we call mixed reality, and this is where we blend the technology and bring it into the laboratory. And this is kind of the, the advanced state, uh, the stage from this on here. So this is a very interesting chart. And I had a, a discussion with, uh, the chief education architect from Intel actually a couple of years ago. So we've been working on this virtual TVET program for over five years. This is not a new thing that we've been doing, but now it's a very hot topic. Um, and he, his name is Dr. Robert Vogel, and he was formerly with NASA, the National Aerospace Administration in the US, and he was in charge of the Mars missions, actually brilliant guy. And he was, he, after uh, leaving NASA, he was, came out as the chief education architect for Google, which is a fantastic title. We ought to have chief education architects for ministries of education, I would suggest, and maybe even schools ought to have their chief education architects uh, as, as well. So his, he was responsible to think about education in the digital age, and so we, over dinner, we got into a discussion about this, and I asked him where he thought this line should fall. I said, I put it at 50-50. I think we can achieve this, in my opinion. What do you think? And, and he said, Steve, I think you're wrong. I said, well, how so? He said, you're underestimating this. You should be looking at 80 to 90% could be, is possible even right now with the technology that we have today. It's just a matter of creating the learning resources to do this. So that's, that's from Intel. Um, and they've been over and seen our development six times, actually, at our factory, which, as uh, some of you may know, is in Indonesia. It's on Batam Island, right next to Singapore, where we have 350 people that are working on these, these programs. So this gives you a screenshot of what something would look like. So this is a transmission, and Brad will show you a little bit later on. He's actually going to demonstrate uh, this stuff for you. But I want to give you a few screenshots and show you a couple things. This actually is from a couple of years ago uh, that we did this one. And at the time, I thought this was really good. You can This will rotate, and you can shift the gears, and it shows you the power 
uh, uh, the power uh, transmission, the, the power um, uh, sequence going through the transmission, how it flows actually from engine to, to wheels, which is a very difficult thing to do. So this is looking at this, this transmission uh, was one of my aha moments and that we worked really hard on. My background is actually also in automotive. I, I put myself through college working in an automotive shop. I had troubles understanding how transmissions work, particularly automatic transmissions, very confusing. I wish we had these things. And so part of creating this was to overcome those problems to ease understanding. Because if you look at a real transmission, you can't understand how it operates. If, you, if it's actually in a car, of course, you can't even see how it operates. Even if, if something you take it apart, put together, you still don't understand how it works. Through these uh, learning representations, we're able to show those things. Now, I want to show you this image, the transmission. Look at this one. This is one of our newer ones from Hybrid. Now, this is the new type of, of photorealism that we're doing. So what we're creating, these are not just, this is not a photograph. This is a digital representation that we created at our uh, virtual studios in, 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 at our factory in Bata. So we recreate these technical objects down to the last nut and bolt um, in three dimensions. This is not a 2D uh, rendering. This is actually full 3D. You can turn it around. You can look at it. You can take it apart. You can put it together. And so we animate these things exactly as you manipulate them in the, in, in the shop. This is now possible with 3D gaming technology. This is why it's so important. We have live actual physics that are incorporated into these games that we can use for teaching learning rather than just for entertainment of your sons and daughters out there. So we could use this in a very meaningful way. It is tedious to create this, I have to say. It's hard. You have to have the parts there. You know, and fortunately at LabTech we have workshop factory just full of all types of technical parts that you can imagine. So step by step, we're digitizing this. So the aim of what we're doing here is targeting the areas that students have difficulty understanding and that takes time for teachers to teach. Improving comprehensive of the foundational knowledge of technology and its applications. So we 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 want to focus on what the student has problems understanding, improve his, his foundational knowledge. And in this way, going forward, like if you understand how this works, and then you go into the workshop, you can now, your ability to troubleshoot and to understand troubleshooting has just magnified several fold. You know, by understanding the basics better, you can anticipate what if something goes wrong, what actually has gone wrong from the symptoms. If you do not understand the foundations, as we all know, you, you're lost. You just don't know the cause and the effect. You're just guessing then. And, and I can't tell you how many students or you know, prospective employees I see coming out of schools that just don't understand the fundamentals well enough. And literally when they troubleshoot, they just guess. They jump around. They don't know what they're doing. There's no system to it. And they're just hoping that they're gonna chance on the, on, on, on the problem. They really don't understand the dynamics of the system. But if you do understand the dynamic system, you can get to the point much quicker and actually make sustainable uh, uh, repairs to, to, to objects. We also developed to prepare them in advance of practical training tasks in the lab. So we, we can do, for example, assembly disassembly on, 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 on this, this unit, and when they get to the lab, they know what to do. The teacher needs to spend less time uh, doing this. So all of these areas actually re relieve a burden from the teacher of lecturing here, and this is a good thing. This should not be more difficult for the teacher to use. This should make the teacher's life easier and to make the learning more powerful. It is a tool for the teacher to reach the students and particularly the students that are have difficulty in understanding things by visualizing. So we teach through the eyes. In fact, LabTech has long had the, 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 the concept of teaching through the eyes. In fact, our slogan is, we make technology visible. And we've had that saying for 30 years and we still do it. Uh, and now we're doing it in a much more meaningful way with this virtual and, 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 and digital technology, teaching through eyes rather than, than, than words. So we could reduce workshop time. And this could be two things. One, you could spend more time with the students in a more focused way, or because you don't have to do the lecturing, the teacher, you could actually have two streams going through the same shop, you know, because they're doing their, their theory work off 
campus or off, uh, you know, outside of the workshop, and you don't have to worry about that. So you can actually plan in the correct way. This can actually double the amount of students going through an institution and still have no greater teaching burden on the teaching staff than before. So that's an incredible efficiency. That lowers the cost of education by 50% for technical and education, for vocational education. If you do other portions of the uh, in, uh, uh, program, you can even lower it further. So teachers have more time to develop hands-on skills and mentoring. This is our objective to, to make this happen actually here. So this is another uh, a visualization screenshot. This is what I mean by visualization technology. We're able to show things happening, like a car going down the road. This is from our hybrid engine program, which uh, we did last year. We're now working on electrical vehicles. So to give you the latest technology in your classrooms and in your institutions is what we try to do. And here you can see the interrelationship of the main systems. You get a technical description of the main systems. These are all animated when they're on the screen. We can control the vehicle, we can start it up, we can accelerate, we can go down the road, and we can see what's happening here. And all the lab tech, I have to say, we make some of the best training systems in the world, the physical training systems, but we still can't show that in our physical training system. It's impossible, there are limitations what we can do physically, but what we can do virtually, there's no limitations, it's just our imagination. And so we try to create these very complex visualizations that are complex, for sure they are, but they're easy to understand and they show the relationships. And so we demonstrate complex interactions. This again is the hybrid uh, from our hybrid course. So now we're focusing in on what is happening as part of this. This is your engine, and this is your, your electrical drive units here. And now we're focusing on the electrical drive units. How does that work? So that comes back to you know, that portion, that right there. You can see this, this item back in here, that, that, but now it's being animated. Now we're showing the processes. We're actually showing how it works. And this is very complex. I, again, automotive is one of my backgrounds. And hybrid vehicles are hugely complex. They are the most complex vehicle on the road. And unless we, we show how this works, the, the students are really going to struggle with this. And so this is what we're trying to, to do and that Brad will be getting into. Here's electric motor. Uh, so we show the detail, the inside electric motor will be spinning around. We can see the waveforms. We can see the poles working. How else do you show this? So this is relating theory to applications. And this is always a difficult thing that we have for the student. You teach the theory, but then how do you get that applied into the school then? This is what this, 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 uh, the, these programs can do very, very well. So in essence, what the effect of this is, is that this can lower cost of technical vocational education by 50 to 75%. Uh, you need less equipment in the school. You can have more students going through. It also provides you digital upgrade. Uh, so if, you're, you have, if you have an old lab, you don't need to upgrade that lab. Just put the digital content versions in there. You now put in the hands of your students all the latest uh, technical information. Quicker implementation time. If you build a new school, it can take three, four, five years. If you build 100 new schools, it can take you a couple decades to do that. Uh, digital can be deployed in, very quickly. Within one year, you could do 100 schools and deploy that and train the staff up in there. Uh, it leads, it helps the teacher. Um, it, it helps the teacher to free up their time and to also deliver a consistent level of understanding for each of the students and that's hard when you do a lecture as a teacher you can lecture students but do they understand and so no they're not all going to understand at the same rate but you don't have enough time to go back to each student and bring them all up to the same level of understanding but this is what we can do with a with a virtual program because he, the student could spend as much time with it until he actually uh, achieves understanding and comprehension and you can measure that the labs and the workshops, uh, this provides a, a virtual upgrade and, uh, and also upgrade to the curriculum. Um, and this therefore keeps your schools up to date and it helps you with performance monitoring because there's feedback about grades and assessments and things like that. So in terms of learning for the student, we talked about the effect on the teacher more. So this enhances learning and it makes learning faster. 
Uh, it's differentiated because it's self-learning and it's deeper because the student can take as much time with it until they achieve uh, the level of comprehension that they need to achieve. It does provide the basis for a flexible learning pathways, which in the future will be very important. Um, I think particularly as AI comes in, then you can stream them to various parts of the program. You do not have to do linear learning. Uh, and I think that is an important concept uh, uh, to hold in your minds. Uh, uh, last year in September, I think it was, we had a a session with Siamio in Brunei for the, at the, the Siamio Voktek. And the Minister of Education Brunei said, we have to move away from nonlinear learning um, because people learn differently. And you cannot, well, although we've been forcing them into the same mold, it's not how we naturally work. And if you could work with human nature rather than against it, uh, then people will learn better and they'll be more excited about learning. Strength and fundamental concepts, you can have skill cluster approach. So you can emphasize different skills. Like one thing uh, that Brad's going to get to uh, show you is uh, some of our, our learning materials in different subject areas. And you could do cross curriculum learning. So an automotive student, why shouldn't he take a few electronics modules or even electrical modules and understand that technology better? Or even IT modules, because Today, cars are computers on wheels. And, and so if, if an automotive technician doesn't understand, you know, networking and LAN systems, you know, the CAN bus system today is basically a LAN system on your car. So if, you, if he doesn't know that, and it's not, <laughs> believe me, it's not taught in most automotive schools, you know, but through these types of things, it makes it very easy. You know, it's hard the other way. You have to take your students out bring them to another lab, there's another teacher that's going to teach IT. But in this system, you just assign them some modules. Here, take this IT module, take these couple electrical modules, take this electronic modules. We can do cross-training uh, much easier, and this is a way of the future uh, for technical vocational because uh, it's one of the things that's holding back really good skilled technicians. And I employ, I employ a lot of engineers and technicians, and I, I can tell you the ones I value the most are the ones that know more subjects, not just one subject. It's the automotive guy that is equally comfortable electronics, electrical, and IT. They're like gold. They are fantastic. They have such a deep understanding of their subject matter that it's amazing and, and, and impressive. You know, it impresses me a lot. And, but we don't do this in schools. It's very rare. Um, and there was a conference last year in Mexico that said we have to do more cross, uh, 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 cross training between different faculties, as we traditionally call them. So formative assessment tools. We, Brad will show you some of these formative assessment tools, but we do both summative and formative assessment. And I'll come back to this in a little bit. Learning on demand anywhere, anytime. Learning process is more akin, similar to work, what work will be in the future. Uh, and moving beyond time-based education, performance, or competency-based. We've always wanted to go to competency-based education. The problem is it's hard. Uh, and this makes it easier, uh, for sure. Um, so many of you may recognize this. This has been around since the 1960s. This is called the Learning Pyramid. And it was based on a series of studies that tried to assess what was the retention rate from various learning activities? So back in the 60s, you had lecture, reading, audiovisual, demonstration, discussion, practice doing, and teaching. I've, I've always liked that they put teaching here because mastery of a subject usually comes when you have to teach it to somebody else. You, then you really are emphasizing and reinforcing all those, those points and knowledge bits and, and skills, you know, come together and you're practicing it with, with the learners and you, you become a master at this then. So I, I've always agreed with this uh, generally in principle here. But, you know, look at what's up at the top and being in this chart at the top is not the best place to be. This is the worst place to be in this particular chart. Lecturing has only a 5%, they said in the study, retention rate by your students. However, as teachers and instructors and lecturers, we're doing this about half of our time. We're spending half of our time doing the thing that is least impactful with our students. You know, something wrong about that. 
So <clears throat> it's not effective anyway. So you can almost throw this out. Um, students, if they just read the information, they have a higher retention rate than even lecture. Uh, I've always found this to be true. Even personally, I can, I can relate to this. Uh, when I would study, I would always read uh, the, the chapters. I would always pay attention to the lectures. And for me, they were effective. But uh, uh, reading to, these two together gave a better comprehension than one by themselves, for sure. Um, audiovisual, uh, a higher retention rate. This is why we have the YouTube age right now. YouTube is more effective than both of those particularly for 21st century learners. They don't like to read so much anymore. Reading is kind of a dying art a little bit among some of the youth. They like to watch. So if you want to learn how to cook, even probably most of us now, if you want to learn how to cook a new new type of food or a new recipe, you're probably going to go to YouTube and, and or, or the internet and watch a video rather than read the recipe because you want to see how it's done. It will give you mastery quicker. If you just read the recipe, you're still not confident about how to do it. But if you see somebody do it, then you're confident, oh, if I can do that. You know, it's, it's that type of a thing. And this is a natural way. This is how people are born to learn, uh, by the way. So if you, you know, all of us interested in learning, if you look at natural learning systems, uh, that we, we, we learn through watching others do. And this is hardwired into us as, as a human species. And um, this is why uh, audiovisual or, or videos are, are, are so useful for us. And for demonstration, too. These are actually related. They're basically more or less the same thing. Of course, it all depends on the quality. The problem with YouTube is it's not often educationally designed and oriented. So you you get what you see and you see what you get. You know, it's it's limited. Uh, it's not necessarily the best design. The demonstration by the teacher, of course, that's going to be more specific to the course, to the topic that's being learned. It is more effective. It's live, and there's also some interactive, particularly if it's a discussion with the with the uh, with the demonstration. You're up to 30, 50 percent. If you then do it, and this is why we get hands-on into the labs, this is where we get a high retention of 75% of and stuff like that. We can also look at auditory, visual, and kinesthetic. So this is just listening to something passively. Visual, uh, it starts out passive, becomes more interactive. Kinesthetic is putting your hands onto it then. And so when we get to this level, that's good. Now, what we try to do with virtual TVET is in this area. We're active. It's interactive. It's you're actually doing something hand-eye mind coordination, which is the kinesthetic approach. We're able to do this. It's not YouTube. Um, so it is back and forth interactive. There's discussions, there's quizzes, there's assessments, and you can practice. So in according to our data, our modules get up to a 50 to 75 percent easily range of retention and understanding. And that would be replacing what would be done at the lecture. So if we can replace the lecture with these types of activities that have this type of retention, this gives the teacher a much better foundation to build upon for doing the practicing and the test. Now, but we said before, 75% is not good enough. We need to be up as close to 100%. So this is where we use formative learning to turbocharge at already high level to get it up to, to 100%. In the formative assessment, we assess the students by a series of questions and quizzes, what they don't know, and we lead them to knowing this. We let we we bring it out of them if it's if it's hidden in there, or we allow them to go back and, and review it until they do understand it. Uh, and so when we don't let them go until they get a hundred percent, actually. Now they won't retain it all, uh, unfortunately, but they might retain 90 or 95 percent. And so formative learning is a way that can be turbocharged. And digital tools like what we use for the gaming technology are ideally placed to do this because um, we have these different models and pathways that we can use the gaming technology to create formative learning assessments. Formative learning assessments are always ideal for most teachers, but practically they're really, really difficult to do you know, physically and by yourself. So this, you know, we put a lot of effort into our formative learning, and that is kind of a turbocharge for us. And so 
this is why we say that the virtual learning program is more effective than traditional means by themselves in most cases. Of course, you know, there's variations between, between various uh, areas, but, you know, it's always frustrated me why in technical education, when it is an expensive thing to do uh, collectively, that we do not, again, collectively put more time and effort in creating world-class uh, learning uh, systems for this area. And this is where we're trying to be an example of what to do. And I hope other people do this too as well. Uh, certainly we are, you know, on the cutting edge as you will see uh, for this. So digital content design, this is not a passive YouTube. You know, sometimes I have people ask me, well, look, I can just go to YouTube. Yeah, you can, but you have no assessment. It's, there's no learning objectives. You don't know who's done that. Is it a good video or not? And there's a lot of not so good videos out on YouTube. And you can spend hours weeding through the videos and finding something that's semi-suitable to show to your class. You know, so this is preconceived uh, according to a well thought out learning objectives. Uh, in fact, uh, Lab Tech, we are one of only three companies in the world that have ISO certification for educational research and development. You know, that, that says something. You know, so we have a very, very well thought out methodology of what we do and we only do things that we th think through carefully you know uh, here so CBT approach advanced 3d games uh, graphic game engines that we use for this interactive realistic simulation we're working on a new thing here it's not yet released 360 degree videos with immersive learning experiences this could be shown on a flat screen but also this is being prepared for VR in the future and we are preparing for nonlinear learning differentiated and adaptive learning. So this is this is where we're going for on that. Now traditionally our systems have been used physically in the schools. We have a number of countries, so we have this actually in eight countries that we're doing in various places and various schools from USB teacher-led, so this could be just simply a USB where you could plug it into your computer and the teacher could demonstrate. We have uh, 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 mobile learning uh, units with laptops or tablets. Uh, we could also put it on the servers locally at school. But all this is locally run. This is not online. We have been going through preparing for a cloud-based system. Actually, we've been working on it for one year to transform this offline content into an online content. And this is difficult because we're using game-based technology with big files. These files are gigabytes of size of graphic information. You saw the resolution of those graphics. And so it's not been able to be done um, online very effectively because the download times are could have been hours you know, to download this stuff, and that is too long. So we've been working on a new version for this, and because of the COVID situation, we've accelerated uh, the deployment of this. In fact, we just got it online uh, last Friday, and uh, for the uh, and it's working. And we're now shifting the content to it every week. We're putting new content over to this as we restructure it and and put it on here. So this we intended to do, but because of COVID crisis, we have accelerated this to all your benefit, and that's what we'll be sharing with you. Uh, this is an example of one of our mobile carts. So this comes with a little mini server. It actually comes with an internet connection, a teacher's laptop, a LCD projector, uh, wireless access point. And so this is all wirelessly um, used. The great thing about this in particular voc vocational and technical education, you can take this into the workshop. So you can use this in your laboratory. You can use this to sync with whatever equipment that you have there or use it in conjunction with that if you have fortunate to have some lab tech equipment in there, it actually might even connect to it uh, then. In the future, we're making this able to be connected with our with our training systems. But that's not the main point. Main point is the is the content to deliver the main content. And the content we're showing you is standalone content that is generic. It's not based on any particular manufacturer's technology. It's sort of a composite snapshot of many, many uh, technologies. So who uses this and for whom and when? We're designing this for use by institutions for their students. We're designing it for adults for lifelong learning. So people that just want to learn skills or want to do reskilling or retrain uh, themselves. We're doing uh, this for teacher upgrading on new technologies. We're doing this for uh, industry for upgrading staff and things like this. And so um, 
we're getting, I think that uh, uh, we're getting a little bit long here to do this. So I want to turn this over to Brad very soon here. But I'll just quickly show you a few things. And you can go and look at the download uh, presentation version of the, uh, of the slide presentation. And these will be in them. So this is how I divide up what, what you look at. If you talk about digital learning, you can, these are the main things. You know, student access, what are the learning platforms, the content, the teacher skills, because this is huge, hugely important. If we don't have the desire to change, we won't change. If we do not help teachers change and provide them 21st century teaching skills for TVET, and this is an adaptation, you'll now, your role will be different. You know, teacher's role will be different. And it's better, it's easier, it's lighter, it's more informative, you'll be producing better students. But this needs coaching, this needs training. And at, with CPSC, I'd like to mention that Lab Tech and CPSC, I hope that in the near future, we will launch a 21st century TVET teacher training upgrading course that will provide the learning tools that uh, you may want. And so this is interest to you or your institution, please contact uh, Dr. Ramhari and his colleagues at CPSC, and uh, we will uh, uh, get this up uh, as soon as possible, probably within the next month or two. Uh, I hope that we can get this up. Policy and leadership. Uh, many of you are teachers or, or, or leaders of your institution. This is very important because if you do not have the policy of wanting to go online as an institution, but your teacher does, it's not going to work. And vice versa, if the institution has a policy of going online and using digital learning and the teacher is not willing or able or prepared, then that also won't work. And so it takes all of us together to make this, this work for the transformation. And this is where we need to look at the curriculum needs to be designed for where do you infuse digital learning into your learning process? This should be in your curriculum. Uh, do you have the, the right tools for virtual delivery? And now that this is online, you just need something, even a phone or a tablet uh, will work to, to engage with this. Your schools in the future might look a little different if we go further down this path road, pathway. Physical training which should be less in the future if you do this. And, but this is important too, that the teachers are prepared to support uh, this, this, this whole program here. Another thing that we look at is dividing this up into three things, uh, the infrastructure, infrastructure, and infoculture. And briefly, the, the infrastructure is all the hardware and the devices. The infrastructure is your learning management systems, your educational platforms, your school management systems, your software, your digital content. This is very important. And the infoculture is the ability of the students and the teachers to effectively use these two for teaching and learning. And so these three things must be addressed, budgets put to them. In fact, this is either, you could look at this as budget or effort. Uh, and it needs to be spread out throughout here. If you only upgrade infrastructure as many projects or, or digital initiatives have done in the past, it doesn't work because if you have nothing to run on it, it's not useful. And if your teachers don't know how to use it, it won't get used. So um, those are, are, are three very important pillars to ensure, to implement, to ensure that your, your initiatives will be successful. It needs to be balanced uh, for there. So you can contact us for tailor-made solutions. Uh, we are, uh, what you, Brad will be showing you is our online portal for individual student uh, or individual learner uh, uh, work. And then there will be an institutional comp, uh, a portal also as well, and you can you can contact us about that. But it has to be made for each series of schools. Uh, the online system is designed for learners from all over the world. And as I mentioned, the professional development teacher training program uh, that that we're looking at, uh, hopefully launching with CPSC here in the, the near future as a service to our educational community to help us all transform. So, with that, Brad is going to. Uh, 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 talk to you about the Lab Tech Academy. And so I'd like to introduce uh, Brad Kerr, who is from Australia, and he's been involved in technical education for most of his life uh, and is an expert in this field. He is our manager for digital learning. And um, so, Brad, I think that um, we can uh, uh, do this then, and I will stop sharing here. Uh, let me come back to our Google Meet. Okay, stop presenting. There we go, Brad.
Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Steve. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Great, okay. Let me just share my screen here. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Um, a big thank you to CPSC for organising these fantastic webinars, and uh, there will be a lot more to come, and uh, we appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I see these people as far as way as uh, Ghana and Namibia in Africa and the US, and of course uh, many people throughout uh, Asia. Uh, so it's great to see uh, the interest here. Um, what I'd like to do is just get people to realise that because of this uh, pandemic, we've really had to change the way we think. And we all know this, but the big problem that's probably out there at the moment is that the teachers are saying, well, what do I supply? What do I give out to my students? They're being given so much to look at. So I want to take a step back and we're sort of saying, well, okay, we've got to look at what is innovative, what is good quality, what is an employable employability of the content and how relevant it is to industry. That's very important. So in the end, more as a teacher, we're becoming facilitators. And already now you'll see in a lot of countries around the world is that people now are calling themselves facilitators. And that means in some ways you are recognised even more powerful. And that's a good thing. So 21st century learning is all about from teacher-led to student-centric and to nationwide. And I keep coming back to, we vir you know, this virtual TVET is allowing this to happen. Virtual TVET is, if we look over here and you see my point here over the side, it's transforming the way we do things. Virtual TVET is a combination of providing educational platforms, learning anytime, anywhere, having really good, engaging 3D content, having cloud connections, but at the same time, we understand that 40% of people out there are using smartphones, so it needs to be able to be mobile friendly, and at the same time, create apps. And then, of course, heading down further down the track, which is coming now, is you know big data, adaptive learning, because of 5G coming. But again, this is where the areas that lab tech across on the right here that is very important. And again, we keep in mind the ICT infrastructure because especially in Asia, right, I come back to it, a lot of people, one, running from smartphones, it's 40 to 50%. The other area is some of them don't even have access to internet or it's very low bandwidth. So you need to be able to give options. So we're always looking at that and as I said, we're currently looking at that. Okay, so what is Lab Tech International? We're about helping, helping teachers and students develop the life skills that are relevant to industry now and be industry 4.0 ready. This means not only equipping our teachers and students with technical skills, but the relevant soft skills. How do we go about this? Okay, where it is always keeping in mind that it's CBT, it's competency-based training. We always make sure that it's interactive, animations and simulations, and you'll see that very soon. It's advanced delivery. It's self-paced learning, which has been around a long time, but again, it's making it relevant to industry. I get back to here, visual excellent, engaging. If it's not engaging, the students are not going to use it. I did a study back in the UK, back in 2007, and it was very interesting. If it's engaging, students were using it on an average between 6 p.m. and 9.30 p.m. at night. In Asia, we're probably finding that that's up sort of between 11 p.m. and 1.30 a.m. based on some of the information we're getting back from our online data already. You know, very interesting. Formative and summative assessments and reviews. So that's knowledge checks. If we don't have these knowledge checks throughout the program, it makes it very hard to throw a summative post-test in front of the students. And so it's important that they get recognised also for this. And supports blended learning. 
Blended learning, I'm a bit of, I, I see myself as a blended learning specialist. I've been in the industry over 30 years helping with online learning and blended learning around about 45 countries now. And it's very interesting that seeing people now, it's very important that they should be planning. Planning about when things get back after the, having access to this online learning, that they get back to the arm to say, well, when we get back to the workshop, is it going to be exactly the same? No, it's not. Your workshops might go from 20 to 10 because of social distancing. But you can plan and schedule that now. If you don't do it now, it's going to make a lot more hard work for you later. Again, there's many ways that you can do that also. So that's the practical side of it. But now where we used to say 70% used to be practical and 30% theory, because of virtual TVET, we're flipping it. And Dr. Steve showed you a chart, 50-50. Very quickly, that's probably going to get up around to 60, 70, and then the 30% practical. Very quickly. Already countries are doing that around the world now. Okay, so here's some recent results online. And these this has come from teachers, by the way. And I've got student data also, but I just wanted to show because I noticed a lot of people, I quickly changed some of the slides, were teachers. So here we've got teachers, and if you look down the bottom here, We've got average, so a pre-test score average of one topic. And this topic is automotive at the moment. And I think the topic was about manual transmissions and some of the hybrid, uh, so in the automatic transmission. So here we have an average of 55 for a pre-test. And then we have a post-test after the nominal hours on each topic is around five hours. And they went to 82.5. So an average increase of nearly 27% purely online. Okay, now let's have a look at some data where you've got blended learning. And this is where you look down the bottom here and we've got a 43% pre-test and then a post-test of 94.5%. Now this is where it's interesting. It goes to show that if it's online only, Fantastic, but when you combine it with blended learning and you get back to getting back into the workshop and doing your practical, look at these, you're getting about an extra 10% increase in your post-test. Now, even more exciting, we've got our 21st century training. So this is based all around the four Cs, which is communication, collaboration, critical thinking and creativity. And again, we, we run a, this can be a two-day training course that we conduct, and it can go up to two weeks on 21st century learning. And this one here was two weeks. And you look at the post-test scores down the bottom, 65. And these are teachers around a whole lot of polytechnics in Indonesia. 65.3. Then after the training, 95.1%. Average increase close to 30%. And what this is is, Flipping the paradigm totally upside down the way people think, right? Collaboration is listening to what the students have. Their ideas are very good and that communication. I did a one-day workshop in the Philippines only last year and it was very interesting to change the way the teachers work, you know, make them more, you know, they've got great ideas. And it's very interesting. This is going to allow things to really move much quicker and allow the teachers out there, right, to do what they're really good at and that's the practical side of it. Let the online systems, if they're relevant, they're good, they're engaging, let them do the job and you facilitate that. You said never be done away with teachers, they always be there, but they facilitate this and that allows them to concentrate on the areas that they knew is where the areas that they're probably um, struggling at in the practical. The creativity side of it, and that's moving into what we call Industry 5.0, and that's another discussion. Okay, so what is the Lab Tech Academy all about? As Dr. Steve mentioned, we cover various, various uh, faculties, and at the moment, our live site, our Lab Tech Academy, Virtual TVET Online, in just a short period of just over three weeks, We've had over 6,000 people register from around the world, mainly in Asia. 
and uh, you're all most welcome. And I said you'll see very soon down the bottom right here, if you can see it, but I said it's on a few slides now. It's labtech-academy.com and you can get free access, right, for 30 days to our automotive, HVAC, electrical basics and STEM. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to jump in live and show you the live site because I know time is pushing here. So here, when you go to LabTech Academy here, you've got your COVID-19 support and uh, 30 days free access. So this allows you to go up into the shop and I will soon, but I just want to highlight a couple of things on the screen here now. And that is coming soon, all topics with a post-test score of 80% or higher will receive a certificate of completion. Why is this important? Because already countries around the world, the governments are changing their policies and recognising the work that students are doing at home. It will have the nominal hours for each topic, right? And because of the pass rate, as I said, we can change this at the moment, we've put it at 80%. And then the other thing I want to highlight over on the right here, weekly updates at the moment, right? There's content there, but Every week we are putting more and more digital content and uploading those topics into the relevant subject areas. So it's, it's growing. So what makes it engaging and what LabTech is? It's all about 3D gaming technology for interactive learning. So again, I come back to it, learn anytime, anywhere. So in our site here, we've got our shop front. So when you go to labtechacademy.com and you can access it for free. So here, here, and you sign, click the sign up, enter all your information. You'll then receive your re two emails, one for registration and one for an email verification. Once you receive your email verification, then you can go back. And what I'm going to do now is actually show you. I'm going to log in here. So you can see it's live and hopefully this is coming through okay. And you'll see a change up the top once I've logged in. It now says my courses. So you can actually register for all these four here. So at the moment, if I go into my courses, I've registered just for the automotive. I click on my automotive and it takes me straight into the system. Very simple. At the moment, I've got four topics here. If I want to go into hybrid transaxle, I then have a pretest. You get one attempt at the pretest. And this is not to say how good or how bad you are, it's just to give an indication where you're at multiple choice and uh, technician A, technician B questions. And then you will go and look at the content. So in the content here, you have a full automotive glossary. So I can search on anything if I want to put in brakes. Okay, if anything to relevant with brakes. Okay, so again there, if I want to go in component identification. Here, it's actually going to load the content. Now, depending on your bandwidth, and it's good if you've got something around, I mean, if you've got 4G, it's fantastic. If, it's a, if you've got something like uh, around 5 MBP download, 5 megabytes per second download, it's fantastic. If it gets a bit below that, it can take a little bit of time. That's why we put that message there. can take plus or minus one minute. So it's loaded up here now, and I'm actually in the component. So I can look at different components here, and it gives me a description. Now, obviously, it's very smooth where I am here. It might be different for you there. But any of this content here, because it's 3D, I can actually rotate it. I can look at it from different angles. And this is what makes it very engaging for the students. Okay, they get the different descriptions. I can look at different components. Okay, I'll close that one there. I can do animations. I can do assembly. I can do a functional animation. I won't load that one up. And then I got my formative assessments. I've got component and reference assessments here. And I want to show you something different here. I'm going to go back to my courses here. And I'm going to go into alternator. Okay, I would, I've already done the pretest. I can bring it up here. 
I can go to my animations, I can go to an assembly disassembly. Now, not everything, but when you've got an assembly disassembly, you get to see the order that it's disassembled. Why is that important? Because the student will be assessed later how to assemble. You can do this step by step. You can do it automatic or you can do it all at once. Obviously, they want to see how it's assembled. That's it totally disassembled there. But then I can do a formative assessment. Now here, I've got your normal reference. So these are formative assessments, not your actually summative assessments. I can do a location, a reference assessment or an assembly assessment. And I was just mentioning to you, how important it is that we look how are we actually going to drag and drop and put together the alternator. So again, that's loading up there. Again, I suggest you all go on and, and get access to the system and play around with it. We also have background theory. Background theory gives us a, basically it's like having an automotive book and it's all here for you on all topics to do with automotive. So you can read through this. Okay, so you've got lots of very good information here to, to go through and it's all relevant to industry. We are keeping it up to date. We have subject matter experts all around the world. I'm based in Indonesia at the moment, but I said I spend a lot of time traveling around the world. That's very, as I said, due to time, a very brief run through. I hope it's given you a very good idea uh, how the system works. Um, and as I said, I suggest that you are all log on to labtech-academy.com, go into the shop and register. And the other thing that I think is very important and we're happy to help and talk to you is I get back to the governments are changing their policies. If we can help and also through organisations like CPSC and CMEO, right, um, in helping ch governments change the policies that are giving the content that is being done by the students and the teachers at home is recognised and it makes it so much easier where now, before we'd say it used to take one year and two years to do a diploma or a certificate, it will only possibly take three months or six months, right? Already countries in Asia are changing their policies and this is a good thing because industry means that they can get the people out there, get them very knowledgeable, right, and get them a lot quicker. And they can earn an income for their families. Thank you very much. I hope you found that very useful for now. I said, uh, please touch base at any stage. Um, we're happy to talk further with anyone. Um, and I said, we do do this 21st century for teachers. Uh, if any of you are interested, please... Uh, contact we do it in joint with cpsc so again contact cpsc or lab tech uh, and we can work something out for it for us thank you very much for your time okay thank you dr steve and brad so now i would like to request both of you to please go through the message box and there are many questions and whatever possible please try to answer and the rest of the questions, we will try our best to answer them later on. <clears throat> okay. Um, I think, yes, I've unmuted my microphone. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Ramhari. Thank you so much. Uh, while Brad was doing his uh, presentation there, I was going through and reading all the wonderful messages from your, your group, both on YouTube and also the Google it keeps you busy reading everything. I tried to reply to as, as uh, many as I could online uh, to the group already, um, but I, I was noting down some of them. Please mute your mic. Please mute your mic. Be professional. Right. So I'll just read out a few of them uh, that, that, that came up. One from Omar Farouk, uh, and it said that if we can adapt the virtual uh, TVET learning technique, then what will be the appropriate time distribution for theory and practical? And maybe that the time differ distribution will differ from trade to trade. Uh, Mr. Omar, that, that's a very good observation. 
and it's true that uh, uh, the uh, the time difference between the um, virtual and the practical is uh, uh, different between the trade area uh, for sure. Uh, it depends on how much time it takes to develop the physical skills. Like some things that we would still consider in TVET, like even business subjects and stuff like that, um, can almost be done entirely virtually online. Um, so it has the potential of going up to 100% even, I think. Uh, but again, the limitation is the training materials. And this is what we're trying to overcome in our small way, partly in the subjects that we, that we work on, is to provide you with those tools that allow you to do more, more online. I would say at this point, we're probably about 30% of the program, maybe 50%, depending on which subject area that we have. So uh, it, it, it probably is in and around that. Our ideal is trying to get to about 50-50 as our, as our medium goal for the subjects that we do. That's automotive, that's air conditioning and refrigeration, that's electrical, electronics, and, and so forth. Um, so we had another question that, that was talking about if we use virtual TVET, then lecturing needs only to be for attitudinal domain. Um, and th that's a good point. I, you, you will not, of course, stop speaking to your students. So it, your, but your lecturing will change. You no longer have to cover those tedious basics that you have to do time and time again. You could uh, use your lecturing to target those areas you want to highlight uh, for something. So you need to probably spend less time on that, of course, attitudinal domain is, is really important to motivate your students and to keep them engaged. Um, so this relieves you from squeezing all that into your already overloaded lecture time period, and, and this gives you more time. Um, we had a couple uh, of questions like this, one from Binod Dakal. How can we manage teaching and learning in this fast technological change with limited resources? Um, and there's been variations of, of that, uh, uh, you know, for uh, of if if you don't have the proper um, resources to do this, and this has certainly been true in the past with the with the in school program. If you don't have the IT technology in your school, uh, it is difficult to 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 do these, and so you you have to. It is a precondition that you need to have access to some sort of digital learning. As Brad has pointed out, in Asia, uh, like a, a survey in the Philippines that was done recently, uh, where Dr. Ramhari is, uh, mostly it's mobile. Uh, 40, 50 percent of the students, I think Dr. Ramhari, have, have access to some sort of mobile device. Um, and so if you can make it mobile friendly, then uh, that probably is a, is, a, is a big accomplishment. We're going through this right now. Uh, initially, our content is designed for laptops, tablets, and the minimum we used to say was a, a seven inch tablet would be sufficient because you saw some of those, those illustrations, they're complex uh, and they're detailed. And so the, the smaller the screen is, is a challenge, but you, know, you watch a video on a small screen uh, so uh, we're trying to uh, reformat the the program so it can work on a on a mobile phone, uh, and and we're actually about eighty percent of the way there already to getting that done. In fact, if you the Lab Tech Academy site is mobile friendly for most of it, uh, it's just the last portion of it that that we're we're now uh, reformatting uh, to do this. So that sort of gets there on on that. Uh, but then you have you have to have internet uh, access too, and and this is uh, highly variable from country to country. Uh, you find surprising pockets with good internet access, and other pockets in some more advanced countries with terrible internet contact uh, uh, access. Um, let's see. Let's. You want to go through a few more, Dr. Ramhari? It's fine. I think uh, I think almost most of the questions are similar. So just there are some questions like related to uh, how can we uh, manage virtual virtual classroom and real practice. Uh, or how what is your suggestions like that? Many questions are in that area. So right. please respond that one. Then uh, we can close it. 
Well, I think the answer to that one is what we're talking about doing together, a teacher, uh, a support program for teachers to, to show that them that in detail, the 21st Century Tibet program teacher program that we're talking about doing together, that that will help them master that because it is a new teaching style. Yeah. Uh, and and it's something that we have to help the teachers do and envision. And it's going to be transitional. It, it won't go all the way. It will be step by step, doing what you can with what you have, taking that next step, taking that next step. And and so I, I think this is where CPSC yeah. is and lab tech can, can help support the teacher. Steve, if I can just add to that, that yes, what it's all about is coming up and changing the way we currently do our lesson plans. And that's what the 21st century learning and training uh, do, mm -hmm. is making making you come up with, and I think that's what they want to hear, Dr. Ramhari, is that what, how are we gonna change and do our lesson plans now? You know, And that's the input that we can help you with using this 21st century learning, coming up, with the adapting and adopting new lesson plans that have a mix of the theory and the practical, but start planning now. Don't wait until things are saying, oh, we're now back in the workshop, how are we gonna handle this? We need to be prepared. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, Nain Singha, please, Nain Singha, please close your mic. Thank you, uh, Dr. Steve and Brad, I think uh, most of the friends learn very good things from these two presentations. Both of them are very great professional persons. And Dr. Steve from United States and Brad from Australia. And now they are doing some innovative work for the Tibet, especially technical education and education sectors from Indonesia. So. CPSC and uh, LabTech, we, we have a very good partnership. That's why, as uh, Dr. Steve mentioned, maybe after this COVID-19 situations, when it will cool down, maybe after July or August, September, we don't know, we will organize one uh, teacher training program, especially in 21st century uh, teacher training as a regional program in Indonesia in the LabTech premises. So then you will, you, our uh, member countries, professional can learn a lot of things from there. Even though you can visit the lab tech website and there are many, you know, shopping lists like uh, for 30 days right now in COVID period, they have uh, made a wonderful arrangement free of cost. Any teachers, any Tibet professional, any manager can enter into that and they can learn. And even after that, that, that is not much expensive, like $10 to $30, $40, the, that is not, you can pay online and teacher can, or institute can buy that software. So you can renew it. So this is a very good uh, platform and that organization is, LabTech is a very good uh, educational material product, uh, producing company and they are producing uh, both like a simulation lab, virtual things, you know, and real equipment uh, for the workshop also. That's why, uh, and uh, LabTech has, you know, in uh, most of the country, they have office in, they have office in India. And uh, I don't think in Bangladesh, but maybe uh, Dr. Istib will arrange some, uh, you know, uh, arrangement in Bangladesh soon. And he, the, he has a agent in Nepal also, and similarly other country, that's why, uh, our institute can get a lot of benefits in different perspective, learnings, teacher training, uh, like uh, buying equipment things for, to set up virtual thing. That's why this is really uh, digital technology and ICT lab, what we are discussing for a long time, and like a virtual learning thing. So once again, thank you for your professional input. Both of you, Steve and Brad, on behalf of Colombo Plan Staff College and all the distinguished participants, I would like to thank for your valuable time and excellent, you know, knowledge sharing things and well presented demonstration things by Brad also. So once again, thank you very much. And dear uh, professional participants, if you are interested to learn more, please visit LabTech website. Now there is in uh, you will get. Uh, uh, this presentation slides uh, from your um, on, on post link. Uh, then uh, whatever you know uh, you want to know or if you want to establish your lab, you can write them directly. 
or if you couldn't get access, you can write to CPSC and CPSC will try to link with LabTech. Thank you very much and we hope in future LabTech and CPSC we are thinking to conduct many uh, international and regional programs like online and real, real in the field also. Once again, thank you, Dr. Steve and Brad. And today I would like to close this session. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Dr. Rambar. It's good. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Steven and Brad. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.